This is going to be terrific. And uh, uh, it includes uh, some uh, amazing people. What we're about to do is something of a mashup ourselves. We're going to have, ultimately, people from the different realms that we've been talking about today all together. And uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to have a smaller conversation, we're going to have a larger conversation, and then we're going to include you. The topic now is the business of creativity. I mean, to some degree, we've been talking about that. We're now going to home in. And of course, it's something of a paradox. Creativity, the muse, the business, all, all the constraints of uh, entrepreneurship and the law and uh, the marketplace. And we're going to try to find out what happens when the muse exists in that context. So we're going to start. Uh, with two amazing people uh, to have that conversation. And uh, uh, the first I earlier had the privilege of introducing, but now on a great day, I, as I said earlier, I get a chance to introduce him a second time. Um, in, in the last couple of years, he's devoted himself to getting young people to vote. And uh, I would say that the million or so people who registered online through a project called Declare Yourself is an amazing success. And the third or fourth or fifth act of a career, which also includes the creation of Archie Bunker, the Jeffersons, Sanford and Son, Fernwood Tonight, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. He, uh, he all, Maud, uh, he's directed movies. He is an amazing philanthropist. He is a dear friend, and I'd like you, please, again, to welcome Norman Lear. Um, and now, uh, a you should forgive the expression, another generation of uh, TV creators. Uh, we're going to start by having a, a three-way conversation. Our next guest is uh, the, has been for the last five years uh, until recently, the head writer and chief executive producer for the HBO smash hit, Sex and the City. Uh, he started working in television for uh, Murphy Brown. He's worked on Will and Grace. And uh, right now he's working on a new project with Lisa Kudrow called uh, The Comeback, a, a scripted unscripted show, and uh, we're very, very fortunate to have him with us. Please welcome Michael Patrick King. Okay. It just feels like you don't. Um, so one of the topics we've been talking about today is where do ideas come from? And uh, I'd like to ask each of you a little bit about that for, for a start. Um, and, and Norman, I'll, I'll start with you. Where, all this stuff you've done, where did the ideas come from? Well, the first uh, thought that comes to me is a quote you've heard me many times. They uh, haven't heard it. Well, they're going to hear it. <laughs> uh, but the first thing that comes reflexively to mind is uh, Emerson's uh, uh, philosophy that we lie in the lap of an immense intelligence, and we are simply uh, receptors. You know, we're antennas. We take it in. From the first day I, I saw that, I thought, that's right. That's right. Nothing else explains all the times I've gone to bed with a second act problem, or how do we black out our, you know, and, and awaken with the answer. Where does it come from? Uh, so that in a mystical way, in a, in a more uh, practical way, uh, you know, we learn to scrape the barrels of our experience uh, in our shows. Everybody came to work uh, prepared to talk about their kids, what was happening. Uh, everybody had to read the New York Times, uh, look at the Wall Street Journal, read the Los Angeles Times, uh, and talk about what was important to them, out of, you know, what was going on in the country and in the city. And, uh, uh, and in their lives that we could use as fodder for shows. We had a similar uh, experience, but it was more about the emotional 
humiliation of trying to find love personally, that uh, we would have to read our own New York Times, basically it was us. And uh, people would come in and they would say, I had the worst date, or my heart is broken, or this or that or the other thing. Plus, then there's life. And then the whole tapestry together is everything that was happening at New York at that time, everything that I knew from growing up, anything that I learned techni technique-wise from other people who have already written, and finally, just the mystery of the impulse that comes from somewhere that you then follow and with technique make it uh, relatable, hopefully. Uh, both of you uh, have worked on shows that have, uh, as they say in the trade, underlying material. Um, what part did that play? Uh, Michael, why don't you start with that? Uh, well, Candace Bushnell wrote uh, an incredibly uh, sharp, jaggedy, glass-like book called Sex in the City, which was really just, she just identified there's this thing happening in New York right now. And these are very gigantic archetypes. And then the book, when we chose to make it into a series, had to shift and change into something that was a little bit softer and more emotional that could come into your living room uh, every Sunday night for six years. So the, the source material basically said, it's like if I was writing ER and someone said, this is a rib splitter. This is what you do now when you're going to open a chest. I'm not a doctor, but I go to Candace's book and I go, okay, that's a sweeping statement mm -hmm. about every woman in New York knows everything about every man's penis. All right, that's what she wrote. So that's the, that's the complete go-ahead, green light to be it's as outrageous Bible. as possible. It's your Bible. Well, yes. Um, that's why I don't live in or, New York. <laughs> or just your religion. That's right. That was the one person we used to say, How, what about Norman Lear? We said, he doesn't live in New York. It doesn't matter. Uh, so basically, we, we had the book, which was a great uh, pattern. And then if we had just done the book, it probably would have gone away. Because as you know, having done a series for so many years, it's constantly reinventing the formula that people like so that it doesn't dry up and breaking it and reinventing it and breaking it and reinventing it. May I ask a question? Yes. But how much, since you were HBO on HBO and not a network, uh, how much did you have to uh, restrain yourself from going as far as Chanel went in the book? Did it, you see oh, the show? We went much farther oh, than yes, Candace yes, went yes, in the but book. I didn't read the book. Candace, Candace's book was not as explosive, literally, and, um, <laughs> figuratively, and literally as the series. Our series became much more outrageous comically. Candace's yeah. book was about the like the genre and the, uh, the phylum and the class of those girls. And then we had to go another level to make it be uh, six years worth of stuff. But HBO was the whole reason that the show was able to be kind of impactful because we were not told, you can't do this. And then they left us alone and assumed we had as much good taste within the bad taste that you could have. And you did. Thank now, you. I don't think everyone knows that uh, All in the Family was based in part on an English comedy. To death us to part, Johnny Spate was the writer. But, you know, uh, far more civilized uh, than us at the time. They, the, uh, uh, to death us to part ran, was 18 episodes over six years, over uh, three years. Six episodes a year for three years. And uh, when we secured the rights and did our version, All in the Family, uh, you know, it was 26 episodes, or 24 to 26 episodes a year. It was uh, an amazing difference. Um, how about the uh, actors in your uh, shows? To, to what degree, uh, as they became the characters, uh, could they be sources of inspiration to you as uh, artists? Well, you know, Sarah Jessica, first of all, besides being a great muse for the writing, and the emotional uh, world that I could enter. She was phenomenally instrumental in bringing fashion into the show and that whole idea of Carrie as this sort of complete explosion of creative ideas in clothes. So she had an enormous impact on the impact of Carrie rather than the emotional impact. So that was huge. And then to know that you can write for a certain actor and have mm -hmm. them deliver and deliver and de deliver. None of the actresses on our show ever said, I'm the character, follow me around, ever. 
you know, and they really took the lead from the writing, which is a great gift. But then we would sneak and I would say, oh, look, Cynthia is a little bit like that. Okay, that will be good. She'll be able to play that. You had a, a huge uh, expression with, with the B. Arthur that was, that was carried on and on. And she, you were saying earlier to me that it, she had already had a lot that you just pulled mm. on. And that's part of what makes a series work, I think. You start looking and looking and saying, what's real to this person? Right. And with, you know, Carol O'Connor, it was hard to think after the first day he read a page of anybody else that hmm. could play it. And I came out to California, was uh, living in New York. I came out to California thinking I was going to meet, and I know he was going to be great in the role, Mickey Rooney. But I couldn't... <laughs> but Mickey Rooney on the telephone uh, said, oh, no, tell me, tell me what it is. What, the, the Mick can hear it. I mean, he, called, he referred to himself in the third person as the, as the uh -oh. Mick. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> so I said, uh, well, you know, I'd rather see you in person and talk to you. And he said, no, 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 tell me. So I described Archie Bunker to him. You know, he was a bigot. He used spade and heeb and, you know, all of the language and so forth. And his response, I'll never forget, his response was, uh, uh, they're going to kill you in the streets. <laughs> They're gonna kill you in the streets. You you want to wear you want to <laughs> you want to work with the Mick. Listen listen to this. <laughs> listen to this. I love this guy by the way. Listen to this. Uh, blind, Vietnam vet, <laughs> detective, large dog. Boy, did you miss a good opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, uh, fashion uh, is, was not only part of uh, Carrie's character, but in a way w is a kind of character itself in Sex yeah. in the City. It became, people uh, often sometimes say the show was just about fashion, and then I would always say, I don't think people are opening their closets and sitting in front of them from Sunday from <laughs> 9 to 9.30, no matter what's in there. But um, uh, it became a great... Uh, palette. It, it was like a great color palette and it was also a, a little bit of a, a struggle sometimes because sometimes fashion and a scene don't necessarily play hand in hand and sometimes Pat Field who is the brilliant uh, designer for the show I'd show up to see a fight between Carrie and Aiden and, and, and Aiden would have a t-shirt on that said chastity and I'd say what, what does that mean? I can't have him. Everyone's what does it mean he's wearing a chastity t-shirt while he's yelling at her? So we would have huge discussions on how sometimes fashion can upstage the words, but mostly fashion was a, in, like a in gigantic uh, booster rocket on most of the show because it just pushed it to a place. Uh, the, the perfect example is in the Paris episode, um, Carrie has this gigantic Versace couture dress which was impossible to pack. It <laughs> would never, that's the logical writer, well, how did she get it there? And uh, who helped her? She gets out of the cab, the back of the cab is this big. I don't think it collapses in like a drinking cup. It doesn't then become a dress. And so one day I got a call from Pat and she said, come on down and talk to me. Pat Field, and your Pat costume Field, designer. Pat Field, the costume designer, who's been like, she's the authentic uh, reality of New York City. So I go down there and she's like cleared out the costume room. It's just me and her, like a parent-teacher conference. And she says, and there's a dress, this dress is placed on the uh, place where the girl used to sit and try on shoes. And it's just sitting up by itself. I mean, it's huge. <laughs> there's no body, it's just there. And she says, with a cigarette, this dress wants to be in the show. Do you have anything for it? <laughs> I said, no! I wrote the script. It never says Carrie enters in a wedding cake and walks around for 20 minutes. And she said, I'm just telling you, it came all the way from Europe. And I thought, no, no. And I, I turned and I walked out and I got three feet and I said, that's bigger than the scene. That's bigger than my little scene, that moment. And you, as a showrunner, you know, there are moments where you just have to go, wait a minute, maybe that person who I hired knows so much more than me. So there was one little scene where Carrie was waiting for uh, Barishnikov to come pick her up and she's just hanging out. And so I said, let's put her in that dress. And then it became 
the scene, and then it had a lot of layers, so then I got to write jokes about Milfoy and him going under her dress and under her layers. So yes, fashion that wrote the was show. That in Paris? <laughs> yeah. So that was in Paris? Yes, in Paris, yeah. Another yeah, interesting... I, I, rem I remember that. Yeah. And I remember you're talking about the Eiffel Tower. Which oh, the is Eiffel a, Tower is really interesting. When we were filming in Paris, they said to us, you cannot film the Eiffel Tower at night because there's a shitty light show on top of it. There's actually this light show that they put on for the millennium, and you can film the, the Eiffel Tower without the lights on it because it's considered part of the world, but the light show itself is copyrighted. <laughs> so you can't film it at night unless you pay. So we wanted to film it because we had jokes about how bad it looks. So we had to pay for the light show that they laid on top of the Eiffel Tower like a bad dress. And yet you could film the beautiful Eiffel Tower without anything. Well, that uh, raises the question of uh, clearances and fair use. And, and uh, Norman, uh, in, in the course of your television work, were there things that you wanted to bring into the show which posed uh, insuperable rights clearances issues? We used to have, I guess shows still have problem with, problems with music. Yeah, lots and of problems with music. And when I, well, the answer is, is an automatic no when you ask about the use of music. Uh, not that you uh, can't pay for it, but in some cases, uh, and there was one, you know, a case I'll never forget. On All in the Family, uh, I, we had written a scene, and Archie winds up singing, at the end of the first act, he's singing uh, God Bless America. That's Irving Berlin. Uh, Irving Berlin's estate, or not the, at that time, not as he, Mr. Berlin was alive, but his attorneys and so forth, they, you got an automatic no. You weren't going to be able to buy the right to do it for whatever reason. And uh, I had a, a standing rule. If, if we really needed it, just go, we're going to do it. And the lawyers would scream and say, but, you know, I always figured, I can't imagine what the damages would be. To, we're going to do it. And we did it. And uh, uh, there was a lot of problems with it. The network didn't want me to do it because we'd be sued. And, you know, uh, they, would have, they'd hold the, they were afraid they'd haul the cast away. <laughs> uh, but we did it. And the long and short of it was uh, Mr. Berlin loved it. I mean, it went all the way to him, and he loved it. So we use, when music was integral to the scene and it couldn't be replaced in an, a, a, another way, uh, we used it. Michael? It's interesting because uh, we had... Uh, so, the thing about that particular... Because I remember that clip. They played that clip everywhere. That was like the clip. Of, of America versus the new America versus the old America. And, and when you were telling me about it, you were saying you wanted that, there was no other song. And sometimes the original impulse is the thing you should get. We were very blessed in our show that like, we could get the really good designers like Tom and everybody to say, yes, you can use our clothes. So we didn't have to say like a fashion show. And now she's wearing zhuzh, zhuzh, You know, it, it felt authentic to actually use the real thing. And, uh, so much so that when uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov was on the show, we had his, he was supposed to be a, an, an artist. And he said, I want to fill my loft with um, art that I have. So we, um, he said, go to my house, get it all. So we went to his house and we got everything. And then he came in, he said, put that there and that there, that there, put it all over the place. And it looked amazing. And we're about to shoot. And the lawyers came down and said, you can't shoot that or 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 that. So we were <laughs> following him, his feet through the house. Because uh, they were terrified that the copyrights, that the artists would block us from using their, their work. But at the same point, we filmed the Monet's Water Lilies and a Jackson Pollock, Charlotte standing in front of them when she worked at the museum, and that was fine. And then I thought, wow, look at that. There's a Pollock in a comedy on television. There's a Monet in a sex comedy on television in your living room. It was an interesting, it blew my mind that there could be art within an an old art within a current expression of art, with hopefully, in quotes, within your I experience. didn't know that those, that, that kind of thing was uh, copyright. Yes. So yes. It, what, what if you had one of those, I forget the nomenclature, one of those great copies 
like the Annenberg collection uh -huh. now exists. It's the entire Annenberg collection, but it isn't the originals there in the museum. The but it, you'd think you're looking at the originals. If you were standing in front of a copy, you cannot be photographed for sex in the city in front of a copy. During the Q&A, a lawyer will answer that it's question. It's true. It's true. There were certain locations we couldn't have the girl standing in front of a mosaic because the restaurant would not release the artist's name to, because they didn't want to. It's all this afraid, afraid, whereas he just pushed through. There's a lot more afraid, afraid, afraid now. Or well, let's take the other end of the life cycle of material, which is the way in which your stuff, in turn, gets used or abused or stolen, appropriated, borrowed uh, by others. So uh, Archie Bunker, uh, did that just go right into the public domain and everyone can now do Archie? Well, in a, in a sense, it came out of the greater public domain. As we talked earlier, uh, those characters are, you know, opera bouffe, is that the expression? Commedia dell'arte, they're larger than life characters. We've seen Archie Bunker before. We've never seen him as Carol O'Connor played him. We've seen all of them. We've seen Edith. We've seen Maud. We've seen uh, their historic cross-cultural uh, characters. And uh, each performer puts a stamp on their own, uh, on the character. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think that, but I think that lightning then hits. I think it's that combination of Carol O'Connor right. and that, that, that moment in time that makes it be undefinably unique. Whereas uh, on our show too, there was just a, a moment where those four girls and the clothes and the time and everybody's heart being broken all at once uh, sort of stuck. And now I see, you know, every Denture white strip commercial has four girls e having coffee in a coffee shop. And, and it's just, oh yeah, okay, they're just all cashing in on the feeling behind that more than they are the actual words or the show. Um, when we were talking earlier, Michael, you, one of the things you said about Norman that you loved about him was how edgy. His privacy? About his privates. That's what I said. <laughs> that it was my favorite thing I loved about Norman. His you, edginess then? Oh, he's so uh, unbelievable. When I think about what Norman did then on network, do you know what I mean? It's, it's phenomenal to think about that now. And uh, recently I, I was working on something and somebody said to me, it's, it's not the, the show I'm working on now, I was talking about something else, and somebody said, eh, it's so long, that scene, it's like, it's like a play in front of TV cameras. And I said, maybe that's the way to go now. I mean, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's what was all in the family, but actually people saying very strong dialogue and, and kind of explosive scenes in front of real people responding to them. I mean, why does everything have to be nuanced, 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 fast, fast, fast? Every scene's a minute now. Everything's fast. You move it faster, faster, faster. Maybe the next move, the way the designers go back and go, oh, we're going to take that from the 30s. Maybe there'll be another move where people say, listen, that scene's, they're going on a long time. <laughs> they're going on a long time. And the great thing about being on a show like HBO, hopefully, is that there's no commercial that can break mm -hmm. up the scene. But it's really interesting how edgy still he is, Did to me. As, as you were doing that, uh, were you conscious of the challenge of being too edgy, not in terms of the studio, the network, but in terms of the audience? No. You know, it's amazing. Uh, I, le I learned that we were edgy because I you know, saw the reaction of the establishment. Not of people. I got most of the mail. I answered a good deal of mail because I, I love the interaction. But uh, it, it, there was no, we, on the, uh, the, uh, the one that most people talk about was the uh, Maud abortion uh, show. We didn't get a lot of bad mail. You know, no state seceded from the union. Uh, <laughs> We, we did the show, and the establishment went crazy, especially the far right. So by the time, uh, and the religious right, by the time we, we came to uh, reruns in June, they knew that we were coming to the reruns in the course of the show, and they were ready now to lie down in front of Mr. Paley's car and my car. And, uh, but across America, there was no big deal. No, that's because you were telling the truth. And I, I think as long as you're 
the, the, the edgy thing is not the words on the page, it's the fact that you're actually saying what people are thinking right. or actually finding a way to frame a bigotry and suddenly it's like, oh, and that's why people think it's edgy because they haven't seen it before, but everybody at home just goes, yeah. Yeah, all that, yeah, that's what I talk about. Was HBO's permissiveness uh, uh, paradoxically a problem for you? I mean, to push an envelope, you need an envelope there. Uh, no, it was not a problem because the envelope we were pushing was hopefully the truth. With, you know, technique, this is going to be a really funny scene because we had a really sad scene earlier. I mean, you know, what you do, you balance a show. But the fact that, that there was no barrier uh, didn't make us go off a cliff. We didn't go, ah, we can say fuck. I mean, you know, we, we, we knew that we could use it really well. <laughs> See, it's still edgy. Uh, uh, you, you're, if you're, and I think the reason that we never got yanked was because we had a great uh, attention to the audience's sensibility. There's, an, there's the truth, then there's the comedy truth, and then there's too far where you lose them, and we were mm -hmm. sort of in the comedy truth. All right, this juicy conversation is going to now get even juicier. I'm going to make room over here and go over there and ask uh, Norman and Michael just to I'll move down. You, and I'm going to bring some other people into the conversation. Um, the, the realm of uh, costumes uh, in sex in this. Marty, we're switching. You're switching? All right. What, whatever, whatever Katie says. Wow. Uh, the good time to introduce the producer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, once, uh, for my sins, was a screenwriter. And uh, I wrote uh, and produced a movie uh, that starred uh, Eddie Murphy. And in that, called The Distinguished Gentleman. And in that movie, I wrote a character that was the favorite character I ever wrote. And uh, I am thrilled today that uh, the, the actress who played that character uh, is here. She is uh, a, uh, a quintuple threat. Uh, I think the world first found out about her when she was in uh, the Michael Bennett musical Dream Girls, where she created the character of Dina Jones. Um, she is well known to viewers of television from uh, Designing Women and Moesha. And uh, she is a wonderfully talented uh, designer and she's articulate and a director and producer as well. Please welcome Cheryl Lee Ralph. We spoke about the way in which uh, uh, fashion uh, can go uh, from a show into the world, the importance of the fashion, the costume designer on a show, uh, Pat Field in the case of Sex in the City. Uh, no one on the planet does not know that uh, ABC and Disney are uh, uh, wild in the streets because of the success of Desperate Housewives. We're fortunate to have with us the costume designer from Desperate Housewives, who has also worked on films like uh, Win a Date with Tad Hamilton and I Know What You Did Last Summer. Please welcome Kate Adair. Um, Earlier today, there was a panel in which uh, uh, EMI was uh, told to get rid of a, uh, uh, a huge division and be much better off. And uh, there was not on the panel uh, a voice of dissent saying, wait a minute, you guys, you don't have any of this right. And fortunately, there is such a person. He is here with us today. He's just back from Khan where he runs the MEDEM conference, which is a, uh, an important destination event in the, in the music business. And his title is Senior Vice President of Digital Development and Distribution for AMI Music. Please welcome Ted Cohen. Up until recently, the Los Angeles Times, believe it or not, did not have a fashion beat, didn't have a fashion critic. 
it uh, did have until recently someone who wrote a five day a week column called SoCal Confidential, but her passion for fashion convinced LA Times management to create a fashion beat, and we're very lucky to have with us today, please welcome Booth Moore. So I'm going to lean up here rather than join you, but uh, this is a conversation which will then include everybody. Um, uh, Kate, let me start with you. Uh, uh, do you see what you're up to in Desperate Housewives as uh, uh, what Pat Field was up to, uh, creating characters out of fashion? Well, as a costume designer, we usually start with what's on the page and the backstory. And I think that's the big difference between that and fashion. And when they do collide, that's terrific. But I start with, where does this person live? How much money do they make? What do they spend their money on? How do they uh, go about their lives? What's most important to them? Um, do they spend it all on accessories and have one pair of shoes? So I'm totally driven by what my writers create as my world. And it doesn't matter whether it's Desperate Housewives, or it's Venice in 1300. I try and get myself totally engrossed in that world. Do you uh, care about uh, what you take from and what you send into the world, that cycle of inspiration, exploitation, or do you only focus on your job? I honestly don't think about that. And I, I mean, we, we joke, Mark Cherry and I joke about the fact that who knew that you know four suburban housewives and a divorcee in their 40s would have such an impact on, on fashion because I don't go at it that way at all. I really don't. I go out um, making things, finding things, thrifting sh things, cutting things up and remaking them based on the psyche of the characters that my actors have created. And it's, the collab that's, it's about the inside out. It's the collaboration with my performer. Do they wear their shoes a size, half a size small because they want their feet to look better? <laughs> no, and Cheryl, you know what I'm talking about. Um, or do they keep something in the laundry for six weeks? Uh, Felicity Huffman's character, I have deliberately in her closet shirts that are also in her husband's closet. So uh, you may see um, Tom Scarvo wearing a shirt in day two of the story that Lynette will wear in day three. And I don't think that's about fashion. I think that's about character analysis uh -huh. and a story driven. And Felicity will be the first one with two children of her own to say, no, 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 it needs more baby food on it. <laughs> sure. It needs to be bigger. It needs to be holier. It needs to be more rumpled. Shirley Ralph, uh, in the 80s, you recorded a song called In the Evening. Yes. And it's still with us. Yes, it is. It, I, I mean, it was proof positive to me that any time I sang in somebody's basement, the song would somehow work. <laughs> and I did that one afternoon with a friend, and who knew that it would become an underground gay anthem? So all around the world, I would travel, and you'd go in a club, and I'm like, that's me. And everybody would fill the floor. And then somebody started booking me, and I'd go out, and everybody would like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, who knew? Well, now you move into the 90s, and I start hearing the song being redone over and over. It's still my voice, but there are now at least 50 versions of the song. They're all out there, but I don't see anything from it. Nothing, unless I book a gig and I go out and sing the song. So to me, it was sort of weird that I created it, but I don't get anything from it. What about the argument that though you're not getting paid each time someone does a remix or plays it on the air, uh, that that helps your standing reputation and ability to get bookings? Oh, I don't go for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. It's, to me, it's sort of like you birth a baby and then someone comes along and says, well, let me just take it for a while. And you're like, no, -uh, that's my child. I, I can raise my baby, you know, or if you're going to take them, what you're going to give me in return? <laughs> and to tell you the truth, for your baby, there is no price tag 
on your baby. They can't give you anything, really. Sometimes you just like a little acknowledgement. It's like, well, we're going we're gonna to be doing it in this country or that country or whatever so that you could at least keep track on it. Then I could do, go visit those countries and make some money maybe, but you know. Now, in the uh, fashion and design realm, weren't you something of a baby napper when you went to uh, West Africa and saw some interesting fabric? I went to West Africa and they have the most incredible fabrics, you know. I was amazed that they could weave fabric with these bright jewel tone colors and everybody would be wearing them and how you know they're not sending them to the dry cleaner. So how are they keeping that color? I was just amazed and I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a line of children's clothing that would keep the color that you could wash mm -hmm. over and over and it would just get softer. So I came up with this line of clothing called Le Petit Etienne for my son. I named it after my son, who's now 13 years old. He's not petite anymore. And I did this whole line and I got into the whole rag business and I took it out there and I learned that, whoa, rag business, design business, they're cutthroat. I thought entertainment was rough. <laughs> they would just come up to your booth, shoot your design. The next thing, some big company would come out and say, tell you basically that they're now doing what was your line mm -hmm. and you're just a little designer with some, something unique and different and now they're just taking your idea and they're just going to do it mass market. So I was just like, whoa, you all take that. I can't deal with that. So I, I, I got out of the rag business. Uh, Ted Cohn, you're still in the music business, still despite your business. being uh, <laughs> uh, de-acquired uh, de uh, mm -hmm. earlier today. Uh, I have a hunch there were some comments you wanted to make on what you've heard so far today. OK. So. <laughs> <laughs> ah, no, never mind. No, it's interesting. Um, first of all, I mean, I, I actually worked with T-Bone years ago at Warner Brothers. He was one of the acts we signed, uh, one of the artists we signed in uh, late 70s, early 80s. And it was interesting to hear how these things evolved. Um, I don't think any artist uh, appears full, full bloom. I don't think anyone appears on your doorstep with all the answers. Uh, I was at Warner Brothers at a time from the mid-70s to the mid-80s where Artists like Prince and The Pretenders and U2 and a bunch of other acts came through, Steve Winwood, uh, where a lot was put into career development, a lot was put into helping someone find their audience and all these things that we talk about that, quote, middlemen do. Um, I think music companies will stay relevant as long as they provide value. When they don't provide value, they'll go away. But in the meantime, the idea of promoting, marketing, financing, the recording, all these things, they're really important. And art, while the internet is incredible, and I've been involved in digital now since 1982. We owned a, Warner was part of Atari, and we started a joint uh, technology group talking about what all this would be. This was about 23 years ago, and a lot of what we talked about in early meetings, it was the guy who invented, talk about appropriating, there was a guy named Alan Kay, who was at Xerox Park. And he invited Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak over to see his new thing, the mouse and the interface. And Jobs and Wozniak said, that's really cool. And they called it the Mac. Uh, they went away and basically Xerox was almost as bad as Philips is. Phil Xerox would create things, never be able to bring them to market. And other people would. <laughs> we used to joke that if you wanted to get rid of drugs, have Phillips distribute John Shelley Brown of Xerox. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people here that, OK. Xerox Park was amazing. They came up with all these great things. Anyway, the guy named Alan Kay led this joint group where we sat and talked about what all this would be. And the only thing we didn't see coming, quite honestly, was peer-to-peer, -peer, which peer-to-peer -peer done right is huge for artists can be huge for music companies. We're just trying to find our way through what all that is. A legal peer-to-peer -peer where you don't get paid for what you do, you know, it's a problem. So I came back into this five years ago, um, basically to see if I could, you know, mediate. And uh, I sometimes get questioned by the people I work for of whose side I'm on. But uh, I think we're, we're going through a period. There's a woman named Deborah Spar. I don't know if anybody's ever, you know, you know who she is. Uh, wrote a book called Ruling the Waves that talks about in any technological or sociological revolution, there's a period of Wild West. 
we're in that Wild West period right now. It'll settle down, it'll work out. We're just figuring out what the rules are right now. Booth, you cover fashion. Uh, we've been talking a bit about fashion as entertainment. Are you covering fashion uh, in a way that reflects the blurring of boundaries? Yeah, I mean, I think what's been most interesting to me is just how all of these worlds are converging, fashion and entertainment and technology, and what's going to happen from here on. Um, Kate and I spoke for an article uh, that I wrote about the clothes on Desperate Housewives, and um, it's amazing to me how many designers are submitting their, clothe their clothes to be considered for the TV show. And I guess I'm wondering from you, Michael, um, you know, was there any thought with all the mentions of Manolo Vlahnik that you would have to pay Manolo Vlahnik, or do you think see that as a, do, do any of you see that as a model that we might be heading toward, where you know it becomes sort of a product placement issue? Um, I think the Manolo Vlahnik is the same as uh, God Bless America. I mean, I think it was the absolute thing that that character would have. So, and our first year it was Pat running around, sort of trying to tell people that we weren't a sex show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and then it became a little bit more, please, they had a, a, a vast warehouse that they could choose from, but there was never, never a, a penny passed a hand. And we did a thing for, uh, you know, Samantha opened her thing and there was Trojans there. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, Trojans paid you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it was the most instantly recognizable condom that you could have just for the joke. But don't you think with, you know, with the incredible exposure that designers can get on a show like Sex and the City or Desperate Housewives or whatever, and also that combined with sort of the TiVo revolution, that you know, they might have to start paying for this kind of thing? I don't know. Reality shows are everybody's always drinking mm -hmm. Coke or going to Sears. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> well, we do. they are. Okay. More people in Sears on reality shows than in actual Sears. <laughs> um, <laughs> There, 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 there used to be uh, product placement. I, maybe there still are today. It's, but, it's but getting huge. In the, the, the first thing I ever did was uh, the Jack Haley Ford Star Review. That's 100 years ago. And uh, my partner and I, Ed Simmons, left for New York. We had a little dinner with our wives. And it was at their place. And I brought a pint of Fleischmann's gin, because that's all we could afford. <laughs> We went there, we did a live uh, show with Jack Haley, and the morning af after it was aired, uh, in this uh, Wellington Hotel in New York, I opened the door, and there was a case of Cuddy Sark. <laughs> and a telephone call some little while later, letting me know, I can't remember the guy's name, but the Lamb Institute of America, because Haley had used the word lamb, wanted us to know they were grateful. And there was a case of cutty sock. But I just, I just wonder if, um, it, you know, if, if if the copyright issue might, in fashion, might be, start to become, an, you know, more of a big deal now that, you know, if TV shows are capitalizing on using, you know, the name Manola Blahnik or using a certain dress design or this, that, and the other. When I was on Murphy Brown one time she wore, and this is before, oh, this was right after the Jack Haley show. Uh, <laughs> this was, uh, <laughs> computers were just starting. Um, Murphy wore a, 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 a vest with a cat on it. And the next day I remember going by the production office and they had 600 calls, where can I get right. that? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's what's going to happen then. It's like, if you'd like to wear what Carrie's wearing, press one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that, everybody will be happy then because you can just get that outfit. Mm -hmm. The diners, designers might be happy and uh, the networks might be happy as long as it doesn't come in the middle of your show. We I'm get happy. a lot of calls. And, we, and as Booth knows, because she and I have talked about it, we get sent stuff continuously. ABC's policy at this time is that, you know, if it's, um, that if it's a pair of underwear you're not going to see that doesn't have the name blazoned all over it. Um, but basically we pay for everything. We may get things at a discount, but there is no, and if on the one occasion we did do a deal that's no longer in place with a designer, it was huge legal doings. Personally, I prefer, I'd rather not have anything for free because it gives me the creativity as the designer to take the actors and the story and the characters where they need to go. I'd rather go on bended knee to my producers and say, please help us figure out how we can make this true to the world you've created. Because at a certain point, you're like, oh gosh, maybe we should use that, even though it's not quite right, because we can get it for free. And I think that's a shame. 
I think we've evolved in the music side, seeing the value of shows as, as packaged as Dawson's Creek, where the music played this week, you know, it's the end of Smallville, the end of some of the <laughs> WB shows, talking about what the music that was used, and even shows like Cold Case, I don't know how many people watch it, but it's got great music and it's the original. They've gone away from the idea of doing sound-alikes. And there's websites dedicated where you can look up what was the music on Cold Case last night or any show. And it's, I think labels have seen the value in that over the last couple of years and are actually you know, making it easier. We'll give you a version of God Bless America anytime you want it. Yeah. But what happens when those shows go into syndication? Sometimes isn't it hard to get them out because of the music that's actually in the show? I think it's harder when it goes like from film to DVD. There's been issues. I remember Bruce Springsteen was in Mask, uh, the, uh, the Cher movie. Mm -hmm. And when it went to DVD, Bruce didn't want to be on the DVD and they replaced him with Bob Seger. There was things like that. But I don't know about yeah. syndication. I'm because when, sure. we, when we did Moesha, we had so many new artists. We'd always debut some new artists, new right. music in the show. And one of the problems, uh, something happened with syndication. Did you the notice music the earring mic issue. thing going on there? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the music became an issue. It's possible. Yeah, I the know. costs. One of the things we've been talking about is uh, openness or closedness in, in creativity, the way in which... Uh, Fashion seems to be this big, wide open realm, whereas uh, movies and television and music, uh, uh, not as much. Uh, maybe music uh, closest to fashion, like it or not, and, mm -hmm. and the other uh, not. Uh, do you think that this closedness, these restrictions, and I'll ask uh, Norman and uh, Michael, is that a problem, or is it just a, a non-issue that uh, people can, can do what they want, say what they want, there's plenty of ways of being entertaining, and stop whining? <laughs> uh, I, I think that um, knockoffs usually fail. I mean, there's the original, and then there's the knockoff, and there's really good ice cream, and then there's other ice cream, and people like ice cream. I, I, I don't think that... An, an original, I don't know, I feel that the, crea the, the original creators, by the time something is ready to be stolen, are on to the next idea. They're not trying to protect their camp. Of, Unless you're a Vuitton bag. Well, I'm not. Okay, but you, you know, <laughs> you know it's like they're so, they're so, I mean, they're so out there. You can walk down the street and every woman will have some version of a Vuitton bag, and you know it's not the real thing, but they'll all buy them. They'll all be on the corner. Yeah, but they're all feeling the original pulse, and yeah. it, they, they're not gonna afford a $500 exactly Vuitton right. bag. The thing that, only thing that scares me is when somebody gets it out before you. Ah. Uh, before mm -hmm. you. You know, that scares me. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. like, here's your thing ready to come, and somebody hears about it, and suddenly there's another thing like it. Mm -hmm. That's horrifying to me. Norman? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, the, whole, the, the, the entire experience of this day, all the talk leading up to it, there's something quite wonderful about creativity as open as we've seen it in that fashion show, as, uh, as you talked, right, where is uh, Kevin, as he, as he talked about uh, borrowing from here or being influenced by this, so just openly talking about all of that. And, uh, and I'm convinced, as you indicated, Ted, we're going to get there in the music business in some way. In right. some way we can't figure it's out It's balancing that. influences and, and copying. Uh -huh. I think that's where the, where the, where the friction is. Who? Yeah. I'm sorry. Sir. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems to me there has to be a way that, I don't know, maybe there's a setup fee to borrow something from the Beatles or whatever. But I mean, that, in, yeah, and that in itself, combining those two albums like, like he did was, was a creative, it was an, you know, an expression of creativity. I mean, I don't think you can, and also was, was a response to, you know, the internet is new technology, to the glut of celebrity and all of that. So, you know, I mean, I, I do think in a way, that the entertainment industry has to get hip to the fact that the next generation wants everything now. I mean, they want ready to wear. They want ready to wear in the form of entertainment um, that they can afford. And the audience has become the producer. The right. audience wants to control their environment. 
Right. It's, they're not taking it off the shelf and accepting it. No, we, we, we get that. Okay. We get that. <laughs> is, is, is there anything that, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, the uh, three uh, at this end, that you've wanted to do creatively but just couldn't and, and that's still a dream for you but because of uh, intellectual property restrictions, copyright, uh, lawyers and so on, just, just stop you. It wouldn't be possible. If you could be Danger Mouse and make your own gray album or, or whatever version in your medium, I, I, is there such a thing? I don't know. For myself, I can't think of. I mean, there's nothing that I want except for an idea that I'm trying to get people to, to relax about. But it's not about, oh, I wish I could have taken that and put it in that. It's all about the new edge, to quote somebody. For me, it's sort of like the whole idea of copying, okay, exactly what is copying for all of us. Sometimes copying can be very different things. The reason I bring up things like copying, like the Vuitton bag, the Gucci bag, this Christian Dior bag, the Hermes bag, I, okay, I got a thing for shoes and pocketbooks. When you go through, when you go really? through, yes, there's a new thing now where they're saying if you pass through France yes. with mm -hmm. a knockoff bag, yes. they are going to fine you. And possibly arrest you. And mm -hmm. possibly arrest you for having. My, my wife made me carry her stuff. <laughs> She told me it was legitimate, but just in case. She wanted me to negotiate with them. Okay. So well, then a lot of television and film writers better not go to France. <laughs> okay. A lot of knocking off. But you see what I'm saying? And then in the music, there's so many singers out there that have created original things, and they, they do this thing called sampling. We all know about sampling. Sometimes you're supposed to only sample, what is it, six bars and no more without a certain... Right. The other costs right. being put on right. it. Sometimes they just take your whole doggone vocal and put it on something else and act like that's okay. It's an homage. Yes, and you should be you should be proud. But then at the same time, you can have an idea for a show. You have a show that's in a particular medium, and everybody will say nobody's interested in looking at women singing up on stage by themselves with just a piano. And you go on and do your little show for, say, six or seven years, and you pitch it to TV, and the same folks that tell you, nobody's interested in that, they take one word out of your show and then put it on their network. But you can't do anything about it. Why? Because in that form, you can't really say it's your thing because they only took one word out of your title. So then it becomes like, well, God, what do you do if you're a creative person? Because wherever it is, if you've thought about it, somebody else has thought about it, and they're going to say they came up with it mm -hmm. first, and they're going to take it anyway. So. Uh, we have time to uh, have a couple questions from the <laughs> it's, audience. It's bleak. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There, yes. White, yes. Is there a mic that, uh, yeah, why don't you just, so our friends on the internet can hear you. Yeah. I have a question for the executive from EMI. Uh, yes. What I, hi. From what I understand, uh, the policy, I'm not sure if it's EMI's policy or the uh, surviving members of the Beatles, but you can't sample the Beatles under any circumstances. Is that true? The Beatles control their masters. I'm not passing the blame off to them, but they, when they, with all due respect to what T-Bone said about them only getting five cents from every one billion dollars, they get a little bit more than that. Uh, and they do have total control over what's done. Be, I mean, I would, I've been doing this a long time and I'd say to you three years ago, five years ago, I could count on two hands the number of artists that we haven't made available for the internet, for downloading, like on iTunes. Now it's down to one hand and it could be as little as mm -hmm. one finger. That one finger is the obvious artist and they are not ready yet. So, I mean, it's their decision. The interesting thing is Michael Jackson owns their publishing. Uh, they, don't, they own their masters and they control the master use for sampling, but the underlying publishing would be negotiated through Sony, which Michael Jackson has a joint publishing deal. He bought the Beatles catalog about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I don't know if somebody knows that. He, so it, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, we have no control over it. A question on this side? Did I see a half hand? Lynn, here comes a mic. 
I just want to make a comment about Booth's earlier question. I have a friend who's a jewelry designer uh, in New York, and she comes out every year to um, you know, loan jewelry to the actresses for the Gold Globes and the Academy Awards. And she said just this year at the um, Golden Globes, designers are starting to pay actresses to wear their jewelry and their clothes. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, sort of what so you were alluding to. It's a new it's a trend. It new is. trend. Yeah, it's kind right. of going to turn the tables anyway. a little bit. Um, we are now going to tell this group of people how terrific we think they are. <laughs> <laughs>